Hey everybody, this is Alicia Purdy with The Way of the Worshipper. Welcome to my YouTube channel. We are reading the Bible through in one year. I am so glad you're here with me today. Today is day 23 of month one, reading the Bible through in a year. If you haven't already, make sure that you like and subscribe and comment and do all the things. That is an incredible blessing to channels like this. And it does a really significant part in advancing the gospel. And just by tapping a little thing like that, you are helping push the gospel through into the darkness of the world. So we're gonna open with a word of prayer before we get into our reading a little bit of the Old Testament, a little bit of the New Testament, a psalm, a proverb to make a nice, comprehensive, well-rounded reading of God's word, creating those parallels, seeing through lines in scripture and understanding a little bit more today how the entire volume of this book is written of Jesus Christ, Hebrews 10, 7. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for a new day. We do thank you, Lord, for breath in our lungs, even on a difficult day. Father, we understand that it is under your mighty hand that we exist. And as David said, our welfare has no existence outside of you. So we do thank you, even in hard times, even more in hard times than even in our good times, Father. We want to declare we need you, Lord. We thank you, Father, that all things are in you and through you and for you, and by you, and it is not of ourselves, or we are the sheep of your pasture, and we thank you for that, for you are the good shepherd. We pray blessing and glory be upon you, Lord. We worship you, and we offer up a sacrifice of thanksgiving, Lord, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to your name, for you are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so today we're starting in the Old Testament. Um, we're reading Genesis 46 and 47. We just finished reading about the reuniting of Jacob slash Israel and his son, Joseph, who has been a slave king, a servant king in Egypt. And he was a king directly under Pharaoh. That's a really interesting parallel, isn't it? That God is the God of all things. Jesus came in the form of a servant and has put himself here now. He's put uh, Joseph here now underneath Pharaoh, ruling all of Egypt. And Joseph just said in our last reading that when he reunited with his brothers, we saw a complete change in perspective and how hard his life has been. He was sent into a pit. He was forgotten in prison. He was falsely and wrongly accused. These are a lot of parallels that we see in the life of Jesus Christ. If you noticing, that's why I love reading this comprehensive daily reading as we're reading the Bible through in a year, I like to see these kind of parallels because these are all types and shadows. Those are some kind of Christianese words that we use. These are types and shadows of Jesus Christ or foreshadowings of God's own journey when he sends his son Jesus as a minister of reconciliation. So what Joseph said that I thought was so profound, I actually got it this morning when, and I wrote even more in my Bible because I want, when I was doing my own uh, reading and reflection on what we read, I wanted to see, um, I didn't want to forget that there were important things here that stood out to me when we were reading. I don't pre-read each day. I'm coming in cold when I'm reading these because I want to be taken by surprise too. I don't want to say, I want to have a real reaction as I'm processing the Bible as a Christian. I don't study up and maybe there, on another day I will. But I do a lot of work on the way of the worshiper in Bible journalism, and I write these long, deeper dives, journalism style, Bible devotional articles on topics and subjects like these. And so, of course, I've read these things before in my life, and I've processed through them, and I've heard sermons over time, and I, I listen to other pastors speak about these things. So I'm not coming in truly cold, but I haven't read this account in a really long time specifically and so I got up this morning and I wanted to look at it again. And I made a couple of notes in my Bible about yesterday's reading. And one of them was this, when Joseph was reunited with his family and he could have been caught up in bitterness, he could have been vindictive. And he, yeah, he played a few tricks here and there on his family with putting cups in the sacks and hiding, hiding things and making them all freak out. But what he said when he finally saw them and he wept really loudly, the Bible says so loudly, the entire household of Pharaoh heard him. He said this, what a shift in perspective of his life that only God can bring in hard times when you are close to God. He said to his brothers, God sent me before you to preserve life. Because remember, he was leading the way in a nation through a season of darkness and famine. 
And so then he says again, he reiterated, reiterates it. And remember, we learned a couple days ago that when a matter is repeated, that it is established by God. So he repeats it again. Pay attention when the Bible immediately repeats itself. God wants to establish a matter in our hearts. He says again, God sent me ahead of you to preserve you as a remnant on the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So God had healed him so completely at this point in time that he held nothing in his heart against the people that had led, that had tried to destroy him. Because sometimes that's how the world works. And when you are close to God, you have a fundamental and profound shift in perspective of the hard times. And you see God, not God causing it, but God with you through it. That's what we see a couple of days ago when Joseph had named his son Ephraim and said, God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And so I wrote here, change in perspective, choosing to see God in the hard times, seeing purpose in suffering, because we know that God doesn't cause suffering ever. End period, exclamation point. God does not cause suffering. God does not use bad things to teach us good lessons. The world brings you bad things. Satan's trying to break you. God wants to remake you. And so we know from Romans 8, 28, that all these terrible things that happen in the world or because of our own choices, all things will work together for the good of those, for the good of those, of those who are follow God and are called, who love God and who are called according to his purpose. So there are some qualifying statements there. We cannot ignore, you can't cherry pick the first part of that verse and say, why aren't things working according to my good? First of all, it's the good of those who walk according to his purpose and who love God. And he does know the difference between those who love him truly and those who do not. Those who walk according to his purpose and those who do not. I'm going to take a pause here and give you a little commercial break. Go over to the way of the worshiper and type in type in discerning God's plan, type in a God's will. You're going to find two important articles that I've written about God's plan, discerning God's plan, walking according to God's plan. And there are resources there. They're all free so that you can continue to seek God's plan. In fact, you know what? I'm going to make a note right now to link it down below about God's plan, link to God's plan. I'll put it in the description down below because I want you to go over and read those and absorb those into your heart because they are significant. We all want to know what does it mean to walk according to God's purpose? And sometimes we struggle with fear. Am I walking according to God's purpose? Am I the Romans 828 kind Christian that God's going to work it all out? Yes. So go take a look at those. I'll link them down below. Let's get into our reading today. Genesis, now you're all caught up. Genesis 46 and Genesis 47 are our readings for today. So Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. Don't forget that now we see that Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob slash Israel have been people of worship to the Lord. It took a little longer for Jacob to get there, but once he wrestled with God and they were, he worked out his own salvation with fear and trembling, God has become his God and he doesn't have this distant language of God anymore. And he has become a true worshiper, building genuine altars to the Lord, not this little like rock he dumped oil on. Now he's building true altars. His heart is for the Lord. God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Don't be afraid to go down to Egypt for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt and I will surely bring you back again. And Joseph's own hand shall close your eyes. Jacob arose from Beersheba and the sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, and their little ones and their wives in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They took their livestock to possessions that they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and they came to Egypt. Jacob and all his descendants with them, he brought with him to Egypt, his sons and his son's sons, his daughters, his son's daughters, and all his descendants. So they're making a mass relocation of the entire family, the entire community is all relocating into Egypt during this time of famine. Now, remember, God had called Abraham into the land of Canaan. He originally said, that's the land I'm going to give you. So this is like a little vignette here. I'm a storyteller by nature. That's why I'm a journalist. I'm a novel writer. I love looking into the story. So this is a small pause in the still promised land of Canaan. 
because God had to temporarily relocate them in order to continue and preserve their lives. That's no different than what happens in our lives. Sometimes we freak out about leaving our comfort zones and this they're leaving their their promised land of Canaan to go into Egypt, a type of the world. It was a temporary relocation. Now they didn't know that. And temporary was like 400 years until Moses came along and set them free. However, Canaan was always the land that God had promised them. And so even though there was a pause in the promise, it was still in effect. There was just extenuating circumstances by which they needed to move on, but they intended to come back into that land of Canaan because God had promised it to them because the Canaanites thought they owned it. Well, they were incorrect. They were the wicked who were not following after the Lord. They are squatters on God's land, spiritually speaking. And so this is still the promised land. There is a pause. We've got to see our own lives very similarly that sometimes there's a pause because God's got to accomplish another thing that still brings him glory. It's still part of the plan. It's just mentally you're like, oh, I thought that was my promise. It may still be. My dad is a pastor. And one of the things he says, a great piece of advice he always gives to people is this, delay is not decline with God. Sometimes there is a delay in our eyes, but it's not decline. It's not like, oh, that's over and you're not going to have it again. It's not always decline. We've got to have the Holy Spirit to perceive these things. So they're leaving the promised land. They're going into Egypt. The promised land is still theirs. God's going to bring them back. And he's got another thing he wants to accomplish in the meantime for his greater purpose. These were the names of the son of Israel, Jacob, and his sons who came to Egypt. Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. The sons of Reuben were Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jakin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. The sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, Merari. The sons of Judah were Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. If you remember from our reading a couple of days ago, they were exceedingly wicked. And the Bible says they died. And then remember, he had two children. He had uh, Perez and Zerah from his daughter-in-law, Tamar, because he had deceived her and she was supposed to marry his other son. And he tricked her and didn't send him to be married. And so she went and dressed as a prostitute. What a messy story of real people making weird decisions because we all do it. That's why. Because people. <laughs> so remember, Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. The sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Issachar were Tola, Hua, Job, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun were Sered, Elon, and Jahil. These were the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob and Padan Aram with his daughter Dinah. And all his sons and his daughters numbered 33. Isn't that an interesting parallel that Jesus's ministry ended, we think he started around the time he was 30 and ended around the time he was 33. I love the numbers in the Bible. There's a lot there we won't get into. And there's a lot you can go study by someone else who has done deeper digging than I have on the numbers in the Bible, but you can't ignore that there are repetitive numbers throughout the Bible. And in God's world, they are deliberate and they do mean something. And the sons of Gad were Ziphon, Haggai, Shunai, Esbon, Arai, Arodai, and Arali. The sons of Asher were Imna, Ishva, Ishvai, Bariah, and Serah, their sister. The sons of Bariah, Heber, and Machil. These were the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter, and she bore to Jacob 16 in all. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, were Joseph and Benjamin. To Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On, bore to him. Now, Ephraim was the one where, Jesus, where uh, Joseph said, um, it was God who preserved me in the land of my affliction. The sons of Benjamin were Bela, Becker, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi, Rosh, Mupin, Hupim, and Ard. These were the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob, 14 and all. The sons of Dan, Dan was Hushim. The sons of Naphtali were Jahizel, Gunai, Jezer, and Shalem. 
These were the sons of Bilhah, whom Laban gave to Rachel, his daughter, and she bore these to Jacob, seven in all. All those who came with Jacob to Egypt, who were direct descendants besides the wives of Jacob's son, were 66 in all. And the sons of Joseph, who were born to him in Egypt, were two. All those of the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were 70. 70 in total. 70 was the amount of disciples that Jesus originally sent out to in pairs of two. So remember, there's these repeated numbers. And again, I won't get into it here just because it's a deeper discussion and we want to read the Bible through in a year. We want to finish out our Old Testament reading. But that is a really fascinating thing to look into when you see that God is always a specific and deliberate God. There's nothing left to chance with him. If he said 70, it was for a reason. We see parallels of that in the New Testament. It's a through line in the narrative because this entire book tells a story of Jesus Christ. Now we're talking about uh, Jacob relocating into Egypt. Now he sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. And they came to the land of Goshen. Joseph readied his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet Israel, his father. As soon as he appeared to him, he fell on his neck and wept a long time. He hadn't seen his father in decades and he had been you know, living as a slave. He had risen to these high heights, but he loved his dad and he wanted to see him again. And before his father finally died, he gets to what a profound and bittersweet moment that must have been. Israel said to Joseph, now let me die for I have seen your face and you are still alive. Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, my brothers and my father's household who are in the land of Canaan have come to me. These men are shepherds. Their work has been to feed livestock and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all they have. When Pharaoh calls you and asks, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth, even until now, both we and our fathers, so that you may dwell in the land of Goshen because every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So there were some cultural disparities between the way the Egyptians saw things and their religious acts and the lowly and like disgusting way that they perceived people who were sheep herders. And they said it was an abomination. It was considered a filthy occupation. Well, isn't that interesting? Because it was shepherds keeping their flocks by night who saw the star and knew that the Messiah had come and were sung to by the angels at the birth of Christ. Jesus is the great shepherd. We see that when he says it himself in the New Testament. And David said in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And we know from the Bible that he uses the lowly things to confound those who think they are great. I think that is such a fascinating parallel. This is why I love reading the Bible through in a year this way, that we can kind of process through these through lines that we see that unite the entirety of God's word because God can be trusted and he has seeded. When you write a novel, you have to seed the narrative. That means you can't just jump out of nowhere and change the entire story in a way that shocks readers because you lose readership that way. I wrote a novel in 2020. I published a novel in 2023 called They. And as I was writing, it took me about three years to write that novel. And as I was writing it, I learned so much about what it means to seed the narrative that you cannot just take a character who might be, say, a shrinking violet, and then all of a sudden make him walk into a room filled with football players and kiss the prom queen. You can't do things like that. It's unrealistic and out of character in the story. So we see here, God is seeding the narrative. And this is a true account, but God is such an intentional God that all throughout human history, leading up to the son of God coming down to earth, he has seeded the narrative with this imagery, so much imagery, but this specific one we're talking about here is the imagery of a shepherd. Shepherds are an abomination to Egyptians. Boy, if that doesn't have a parallel in the world, shepherds, sheep herders, people who pastor flocks, people who lead flocks of God's people, they are an abomination to the Egyptians of the world. We we see that right now. Just scroll on Instagram and you will see social media channels bashing Christians, pastors trying to tear them down. It's no different now than it was then. Maybe the circumstances are slightly changed, but the principle remains. And I love that Jesus Christ called himself the good shepherd. My sheep know me. They know my voice. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Okay, so here we are in Genesis 47. 
He just told his family, we're going to kind of keep it quiet that you're shepherds and sheep herders because you, your occupation is an abomination to the people of Egypt. And Joseph spoke Egyptian. He got their culture and he knew how to translate that over to their family so they could be in the world, but not of it. Genesis 47, then Joseph went and told Pharaoh, my father and my brothers and their flocks and their herds and all they possess have come from the land of Canaan and are now in the land of Goshen. He took five men from among his brothers and presented them before Pharaoh. Pharaoh asked his brothers, what is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. They said to Pharaoh, we have come to sojourn in the land for your servants have no pasture for their flocks because the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please allow your ser servants to dwell in the land of Goshen, a separate land from the immediate area of the Egyptians. Pharaoh spoke to Joseph saying, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and your brothers dwell in the best of the land. Have them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if you know of any capable men among them, then put them in charge over my livestock. Then Joseph brought Jacob, his father, in and presented him to Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. I'm going to start saying that the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 46 years. Every time someone asks me, the days of the years of my life have been few and evil, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the lives of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. So he's comparing himself to the success in the glories of his fathers, Isaac and Abraham. And even though he himself has lived a difficult life, he's made some really bad choices. He was known as a deceiver in his former life. Sometimes we look at ourselves that way too. We look at ourselves in light of our former self before we were in Christ. We look at our past. We compare ourselves. It can be hard when you've come out of a difficult life and you've come into Christ and you look at other people's lives and we we develop this perspective of comparison. God doesn't want us to do that. You have your own trajectory and journey and you've got to look at your life in, just like Joseph did through the lens of God's faithfulness and his provision in the land where you were held captive in the land of your difficulty, because he's looking back with some regret here. And we all do that. But I want to encourage you, don't compare yourself to what your fathers built. Don't compare yourself to what came before you or all the woulda, coulda, shoulda. We all have it, but you're here now. And this is what matters in God. He can pick up right from where you, where he met you on the road. That's what he does. We saw that in the story. We see that in the story of the prodigal son. God will meet you right where you are on the road and bring you in. It's okay. You're going to be okay. You just start here. You start now. You start today. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. And Jacob settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best part of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. Joseph provided food for his father, his brothers, and his father's entire household, according to the number of their children. There was no food at all in the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan languished because of, because of the famine. Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain that they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. When the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, give us food. Why should we die in your presence? For our money is gone. Joseph said, give your livestock and I will give you food for your livestock if your money is gone. So now they're going to start into a bartering system because the land has become so severely famined. They have no more money. And he's like, well, we can barter livestock. So we'll just keep going so that people don't starve. Don't forget, Joseph had really well managed and stewarded the resources of Egypt. So they still had enough, the Bible says, to take care of everybody, but they weren't going to give something for nothing. So now people are bartering with their livestock. They brought their livestock to Joseph and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, and the donkeys. And he fed them with food in exchange for all their livestock for that year. When that year was ended, they came to him the second year and said, we will not hide it from our Lord that our money is all spent. Our Lord also has our herds and our livestock. There is nothing left in the sight of the my Lord, but our bodies and our hands." Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us 
and our land for food, and we and our land will be slaves to Pharaoh. Also give us seed so that we may live and not die, so that the land will not be desolate. So they're so hungry now, they're going to sell themselves into slavery so that they can eat. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every Egyptian man sold his field because the famine was so severe on them. So the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he moved them into cities from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy. For the priests had an allotment from Pharaoh and they lived off of their allotment that Pharaoh gave him. Therefore, they did not sell their lands. Then Joseph said to the people, I have bought you and your land today for for Pharaoh. Here is the seed for you that you may sow on that land. So they're essentially now they've become slaves and sharecroppers. Their land is no longer their own and everything they farm belongs now to Pharaoh. Whereas before they had some kind of ownership of the land, they've sold themselves. And now Pharaoh has greatly increased his wealth in this time of famine. Not only are we setting up a, a even stronger slavery system here. These people no longer own their land even, so they're now sharecroppers on what belongs to Pharaoh. At the harvest, you must give a fifth part to Pharaoh and four parts will be your own as seed for the field and for your food and for those of your household and for food for your little ones. And they said, you have saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord and we will be Pharaoh's slaves. So Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth part except from the land of the priests, which did not become Pharaoh's. Israel lived in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they had numerous possessions there and grew and became very numerous. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the years of Jacob's life were 147 years of the days of his pilgrimage. <laughs> When the time drew near when Israel would die, he called his son Joseph to him and said, If now I have found grace in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly, truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you've said. And he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself at the head of his bed. So now we're at the end of our reading in the Old Testament. We're going to switch over to the New Testament. Don't forget that God had promised Jake, uh, Joseph that he would be the one to close his father's eyes. So here they are at the end of Israel's life and his sojourning and his pilgrimage on earth. And now we know what's going to come next. If you've read the Bible before, you know that more is to come as J Joseph has, uh, we're working through this famine. More is to come in this trajectory in this family that you're going to continue to see the provision of God, even in hard times that come to us all. But what a beautiful testimony this is here of how God puts families back together. Okay, so we're going to switch over to our New Testament reading. We are reading today Matthew 15. 1 through 28. We've been reading this account of Jesus from Matthew's perspective. It's really shown so many nuggets of truth and wisdom about the life of Jesus Christ from Matthew's perspective and the accounts that he wrote of and Jesus's ministry. And so in Matthew 15, Jesus is starting to talk to the elders. We're reading verse 1 through 28. So we won't finish the whole chapter today, but what an interesting exchange we're going to see here with Jesus. And he's always contending with the religious rules, the scribes and the Pharisees, the traditions of men and the way things have always been, because some people just hate change. And when you are in Christ, you represent that tearing away of people and their hoarded resources, as the old hymn would say. So Matthew 15, then scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, why do your disciples violate the tradition of the elders for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread? But he answered them and said, why do you also violate the commandment of God by your tradition? 
I love that Jesus uses this Socratic rhetorical method when he's talking to the Pharisees. Jesus gives as good as he gets. And this is, you know, the principle about being wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Jesus is answering them. He's twisting their own rhetorical statements and their entrapment questions, and he's entrapping them. Jesus was an intelligent person. And you can see here, not only was he raised with the Torah and the books of the law, when he was 12 years old, he was reading in the temple out of the book of Isaiah and saying, say, this was me. This is what they're talking about. And he upset everybody. Jesus is no fool. He's as wise, shrewd, cunning, intelligent, and educated as a Pharisee would be, except as the son of God. He came to fulfill the law, which is, of course, something that they do not receive at all. But he's able to contend with them tit for tat. And he's not having their old religions and their entrapments because this is what he came to accomplish. And so sometimes we use the language of the people, not the bad language, but we use the style in which people are speaking in order to reach them or provoke them. Because there are certain people that you're going to reach in your life that I'll never reach because of how I look and how I act. And because of how you look and because of how you act, you have access into people's lives that people like me would never have. People like some prestigious pastor. There are people who reach people out on the streets who are down and out, who live difficult lives simply because of how they look and they can speak the language of those people. That's an important role in the kingdom of God. So never discount that because what Jesus is doing here as he is speaking the language of the Pharisees. And this is very impactful because we know some scribes and some Pharisees like Nicodemus, they do turn to Jesus Christ as the Messiah. That's huge because he could speak their language. And you have a language that you can speak. Go speak it to the people that you have access to. That's what Jesus is doing here. When he pushes back saying, why do you violate the commandments of God by your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil to father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever shall say to his father or mother, what you would have profited from me as a gift from God will be free from honoring his father and mother. So you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition, you hypocrites. All right, I'm getting out my highlighter. I got to write. I got to highlight this in every gospel where it's mentioned. It's mentioned in the other place it's mentioned is in Mark. I love it. And I actually like how Mark says it a little bit better, but I'm going to put a highlighter and a note in here because this is a significant principle in the Christian faith. This happens all the time and it's so off-putting to the world and it drives people away from the church. Why? Hypocrisy. That's a huge one that Jesus notes right here. Because you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. There's nothing wrong with certain types of tradition, but when it becomes a snare, when it becomes a prison and you can't do anything else, or you must do this, or you're not a good person, you're not going to get into heaven. You are not going to be affecting the kingdom. You have to do this because I said so. We have interpretations, we have bylaws, and we have so many things in the church that as I get older, I was raised in the church. I'm the daughter of a pastor. I grew up in the ministry. I was a ministry princess. I am telling you, it shipwrecked, it shipwrecked me in my faith for a long time as I had to weed out in my own heart what is the tradition of man versus the commandment of God. My generation, Generation X, has gotten all caught up in things like being an ex-evangelical and deconstructing the faith. What a load of malarkey. Now, I'm not at all discounting people who have deep questions, who need real answers, and who are picking apart, as I have had to do, and sometimes still have to do, picking apart what we've been told versus what God has said. And that's what he's talking about here. They were teaching things God never said and God never meant, but they were putting words in God's mouth. And this is why it needs to be underlined in your Bible. This is why Paul said we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Your own salvation, not the doctrines you've been taught. You've got to know for yourself. And I want to say this, whatever the abuses of the church have been, and I have seen them all. I've seen all the abuses. I grew up in the ministry and I grew up in a Pentecostal tradition. So let me tell you, if anyone's seen some weird stuff, it's me. 
my husband as well. We have seen all the weird of the weird. We've been there. We've done that. Let me tell you what, we've had to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling before God because we had to wrestle with God like Jacob did and come to the conclusion at the very end of it all, it was never God's fault. Those things that we mistakenly believed, that was because someone else told us. But when we found out for ourselves and we began to truly seek the Lord in his word and seek wisdom and understanding, like the book of Proverbs says, it was transformative in our personal journeys with God. I challenge you to do the same thing because you may be, if you are bitter against God or you are blaming God for something, or you are off put from God, or you have departed from your faith because of your experiences in the church, it was never God's fault. Come home. It was never God's fault. You probably are stuck here. In Matthew 15, 6, you have experienced this. You have made the, the Pharisaical per, uh, approach to faith that you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. You're welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions. I have been there, my friends, done that. You hypocrites. Jesus says, Isaiah well prophesied of you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain, they do worship me, teaching as doctrines, the precepts of men. Underline, put a little bracket around that. That's a big deal. In the book of Isaiah, this is a profound scripture that he prophesied and he knew what happened anyway. And here we are teaching as doctrine, the precepts of men and fake worshiping God. Yes, there is such a thing as fake worship of God. I have multiple articles and resources you can study up about this because drawing near to the Lord with their mouth and honoring God with your lips, God knows if your heart is far from him, he knows the difference. Maybe I don't, maybe your pastor doesn't, Maybe your family doesn't, but God knows if you are honoring him with your lips. He knows if you are drawing near to him at church. He knows if your heart is far from him. This is the time to get right with God and to get back into relationship with him and stop being a phony. Do you know how many Christians are phonies and hypocrites? I've seen them. I know a bunch of them. I've walked alongside with them. It's a wheat in the tares. This is not a judgment against them. And I'm not judging people's hearts. What I'm saying is God has exposed their behaviors over time where you can begin to discern. And you can definitely, over time, you cannot live in hiding forever. You cannot fake worship God for the rest of your life. At some point in time, it will be exposed because he loves you. Only Satan wants to break you. God doesn't want to break you. He wants to remake you. And if that is your heart, then you're going to have to walk through this journey. God knows if your heart is far from him, so you might as well stop pretending. He read, He knows what's in your head and your heart. Probably be definitely better than you do. Definitely better than I do. This is the time to get right with God and to draw back near to him because it was never his fault. No more deconstruction, no more ex-evangelicals. It's not about these rules and these precepts. It's about the, dot, the commands of God and they are here in his word and you've got to know them for yourself. Okay, let's finish our reading today. We're going to verse 28. He called the crowds and said to them, hear and understand that which goes into the mouth does not defile a man, but that which comes out of the mouth defiles a man. We know out of the content of the heart, the mouth speaks. We read that a couple days ago. Jesus is reiterating here. And now the matter is established. Then his disciples came to him and said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended after they heard you saying that? But he answered, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. That's what I was just talking about. Eventually it is coming. You will be uprooted, not in wrath, in love. Leave them alone. They are blind, leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a ditch. But you're not blind. You're awakened. Let your heart be awakened by the Holy Spirit. Don't be one of these people. This is what the uprooting. He's saying this is going to be the inevitable conclusion. I'm underlining here. Leave them alone. They don't want to be woken up. Then Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Jesus said, are you still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that that which enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is cast out into the sewer? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. Let's underline that. But the, I need to remember this for myself later. I underline things so that my eye catches them when I'm reading my 
and processing later on. And I'm going to put together the resources that are linked down below, free devotional sheets that you can process. Those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, the heart, which is exceedingly wicked, the Bible says. They defile you for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immorality, thefts, false witness, and blasphemy. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat bread with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile a man. He's talking about spiritual defilement. And we read all the way back in the days of Noah, when at around the time of the Tower of Babel, God finally was like, okay, so a man's heart is exceedingly wicked from the first days of his youth. This was something that God's holiness cannot reconcile because God does not know sin and wicked. He has no wickedness. He has no sin nature, but he has perceived that mankind is wicked from the days of his youth. The Bible says earlier in Genesis, that's what Jesus is talking about here. This is why we need a process of sanctification in our journey of faith. Then Jesus went from there and departed into the regions of Tyre in Sidon. There, a woman of Canaan came out of the same regions and cried out, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely possessed by a demon. This is an unregenerated, unsaved, quote unquote, Canaanite woman. And so when those things uh, when we see people that live in these these pagan lands, they're often tormented by things that come, spiritual forces that are invited through sin. They are invited through spiritual permission, whether passive or active, through the sin and darkness of the world, and they torment people. There is spiritual access there that is permitted through the law of sin and death. She needs Jesus. But he did not answer her a word, and his disciple came and begged him and said, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then, then, then she came and worshipped him and said, Lord, help me. And he answered, it's not fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. So he was saying, I came to the house of Israel. Healing is the children's bread. It belongs to the people of God. I've said this so many times and I'll say it again. People get mad at God that they don't get his promises and his protection. You got to be one of the people of God. You've got to be one of them. Every, everything else is God's merciful gift, but you are not entitled to it. If you decide to live in the wicked world, you have no claim to the promises of God. And it's only because of his mercy that he allows you to have that. It reigns on the just and the unjust. We know that the Bible says we've seen God heal all kinds of unsaved people. We've seen that he's healed many Gentiles. And so what he's saying here is that healing belongs to the people of God. We are the ones who have access to his promises, his protection, and all the things promised in his word. So he's talking to this Kate, but she worshiped him. Worship gives you greater access into God's presence. If you're not a worshiper, you're still missing the point. She comes and worships him. And he says, it's not fair to take the children's bread, healing that access that God's children have and throw it to the dogs. These are people, he's not calling her a literal dog. He's using, he's using an idiomatic expression to let her know you're not one of us. Now we know that he came and even Gentiles would believe. So it's not that she'll never have access, but she is currently not of the house of God. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. That is the reigning on the just and the unjust. That is the mercy of God. My mom's a nurse and she has told me before that she really believes that modern science and medicine are God's mercy on the wicked because even bad people can have access to good medical care that can be the hands and feet of Jesus that heals them. Sometimes it doesn't, but they still have access to that. They have access to ibuprofen for a headache. They have access to getting a bone set and having a bacterial medication, a penicillin for a bacterial infection. We have access to these things, even the wicked do. And that's what she's saying. She's actually speaking prophetically here saying, even dogs eat crumbs that fall from the master's table. That is an image of the mercy of God. That's the theme here. And Jesus said to her, O oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed 
instantly. What a powerful reminder of God's great mercy. We're not going to teach the doctrines of men as God's commands. We see here that there is healing available even to the unjust because of God's great mercy. That's the end of our old te- our New Testament reading in Matthew. Let's finish out with a psalm and a proverb. We're reading today, day 23, reading the Bible through in a year, Psalm 19, 1 through 14. This is a Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night declares knowledge. I'm going to pause right here. This is how we know there is a God, and so does the unsaved world. The Bible is very clear. Its words are true and can be trusted. It's the heavens that declare the glory of God. You look up at the stars, people who chart nature, and they see what's going on in our earth. They have become seared in their conscience to disconnect God from all of this. But the Bible is clear that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament, that's the earth that we stand on, and the heavens above. The firmament shows his handiwork. That's the heavens above our head, the clouds and all of its glory, the sunrise, the things that we witness. Day unto day utters speech. They speak of God. Night unto the night declares knowledge. This is how we chart stars. You can navigate a ship. Night unto night declares knowledge. There is no speech and there are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. All humanity of all time in every location of the world can understand that there is something greater than themselves out there. Even if they don't know his name, they can still worship the God who made those things instead of worshiping themselves. In them, he has set a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run a race. It's going forth is from one end of the heavens and its circuit extends to the other and there is nothing hidden from the heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So that's Psalm 19, 7 through 9. And I want to pull out a few grammatical things here as a writer and journalist that I'm seeing a theme here worth looking into writing down in your own journal, the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, and the judgment of the Lord. These are all things that believers must carry inside of them. And you're only going to find it here in God's word, the original source, the only source of truth and wisdom in existence. More to be desired are they than gold. Yes, yes, than fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. By keeping them comes great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be upright and innocent from great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. A profound principle here in Psalm 19, who can understand his errors? And he asks God, I pray this for myself. Cleanse me from secret thought, secret faults, Lord. Keep me back from presumptuous sins that they would not rule over me. This is the carnal behaviors and the things that we have not brought out of our spirit to the Lord. I want to be very clear with you about something. God already knows you're not hiding anything from him. He knows our filthy, disgusting fantasies. He knows our secret bad behaviors. He knows what we're holding back emotionally. He knows the strongholds in our lives. He understands the generational behaviors that we carry inside of us. He knows you don't need a cleansing into salvation anymore, but you need a daily cleansing with the washing of the word, like the Bible says in Ephesians, to cleanse you from your secret faults. When God comes, he reveals himself and he reveals you, to you. You need that. I need that cleansing from secret faults. I don't want to be trapped by presumptuous sins. I don't want it. But sometimes we're surrounded by wickedness. Sometimes it's easy to get set. It gets on us. I want that. So I pray that over myself all the time. 
not out of fear, out of a love for the Lord. I want to be more like him and change from glory to glory. Hope that's your prayer today too. The enemy does not want you to pray things like that. He wants you to be entrapped and ensnared. Cry out to the Lord, ask him to reveal himself to you and to reveal you to yourself. Proverbs 4, we're going to end with Proverbs 4, 14 through 19. Little daily dose of wisdom today setting up an entire book where these nuggets are really sometimes hard to digest because they're so filled with awesome things that you just got to mull them over for a little while. So we're reading them in small chunks. Proverbs 4, 14 through 19. Do not enter the path of the wicked. Oh, there you go. See, cleanse me from the secret false. Sometimes we drift over that way into the path of the wicked. We've got to be awake to ourselves. Do not enter the path of the wicked, nor, no, nor do not go in the way of evil men. Avoid it, avoid it, avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it, turn from it, turn from it. Pass on. For they do not sleep unless they have done mischief and their sleep is taken away unless they cause someone to fall. That's not gonna be me. I've determined, like David said, I will not sin in my heart. I've determined. Well, here you go. Sometimes you need to take action on that as well. You need to do not enter, do not go, avoid it. Don't travel on it, turn from it. Pass on. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence, but coordinating conjunction there. Yeah, you know, I love that as a writer. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They do not know at what they stumble. Whew, that's a nice media one. Goes right in with our reading from the psalm today. This is why I love reading the Bible through in a year. Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm, and Proverbs. I love reading it this way. There's no other way for me. Sometimes I've done other ones, but I have not enjoyed them to the level that I have this way. I'm reading out of the modern English version. You can read out of any version you want as you're reading, or just put this up in the window. Go back to day one if you're just joining in the channel. But we are done for today. Day 23, reading the Bible through in a year. I am Alicia Purdy from The Way of the Worshiper. Check out the resources below. Do a little something today to advance this gospel. Like, subscribe, leave a comment below. This is how we fight this battle. And you are a warrior in the battle. You don't need to start a channel reading the Bible through in a year to be effective, but you can support one. And this is how it's done. Well, thank you for joining me. We're going to close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Lord, we put our trust in you. Father, would you cleanse us from secret faults? Lord, we don't want to be ensnared by great transgressions and presumptuous sins. We want to honor you with our lives, Lord. Help us, empower us, Lord. Strengthen us. We invite you, Father, to provoke us, to depart, to turn, to pull away from wickedness, to perceive it with our eyes and go in the other direction. Father, what a challenging thing it is when our flesh battles our spirit. We need you, Lord. We need your Holy Spirit. Father, we commit to taking action. Would you provoke us, Lord, to do something different? Would you open our eyes to what's around us and then help us and strengthen us with your grace that is sufficient? that we could turn, Lord, and turn and turn from and turn to you because that's our heart desire is more of you and less of us. Thank you, Father, for your great mercy and faithfulness toward us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining me once again. I'm Alicia Party with The Way of the Worshiper. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.